tonight, so I'm going to show you how to assemble this device. Um, there's PVC pipe, it's uh, half an inch is the size. It's available at any hardware store like Home Depot or Lowe. Uh, I cut them with a PVC pipe 23.5 inches. That way when you apply two sets of fittings, the widest it becomes is two feet. The idea is that we're going to build a triangle that is two feet high by two feet wide, which I think is the minimum working space for an intubation, like high-risk intubation specifically. Uh, you're going to need your 72 by 72 inch uh, vinyl sheeting. Um, you can use any real plastic you want. There's a couple different plastics out there used for shower curtains. Um, the one I used was $5 on Amazon, and I'm sure you can get bulk discounts. Get the clearest one you can find because visibility is important. This is the only part you can't buy at a store. It's uh, a C-clip. Um, so they take about five minutes to 3D print each. Uh, use them at a PLA, which is the cheapest 3D printing material we have. Um, and what it does is it enables you to snap parts onto the PVC pipe. If you can find a standardized part, let me know. Otherwise, duct tape works fine all the same. This is just reusable. You can do it um, snap on, snap off, and make adjustments without um, increased work. Uh, another standard part is this three-wheel uh, stopcock. Uh, it connects the two ends together, uh, and in some cases will actually connect the third end, um, or you can use it as basically an anchoring point um, on the edge. So use it as you want. Um, but you're gonna need at least six at a minimum. So you have your sheet, your pipes, uh, your three-way fittings, and your C-clamps. Uh, the designs for the C-clamps are online. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna take uh, two posts, and you're going to apply the three-way stopcock in a symmetric fashion. So they both point the same direction. So you're gonna build one, build two, uh, and then for each of these, you're gonna add two more components. So I'm gonna take my first piece and I'm gonna add two components. So one, two, that's gonna be my base. And then two more for the front frame, one, two. Then I'm gonna add the top, one, two. So this is your basic frame. It weighs maybe two or three pounds, very lightweight. Um, PVC is a great material. Um, and then with your C-clamps uh, and remaining parts, everything else is modifiable or extra. Uh, I actually like the idea of adding weight, so I'm gonna add these two pieces to the end. Um, I'm gonna move around a lot, so it's good to have some counterweight. And ideally, you built the frame at a bare minimum before you have a patient come into the emergency department. I'm gonna go in and assemble the whole tent, because again, in a perfect situation, all of these things would be set up in advance. So I'm gonna have my seat clips ready. I'm gonna take my sheet, which again has to be pre-cut. You're gonna cut six inch holes at sites. I'll show you a little roadmap of where you can cut them for end users. Since it's 72 inch square, uh, everything can be standardized uh, for user to user. You're gonna drape over the top section. You're gonna take these two front holes uh, and put them towards you to make them symmetric in the center of the box. Uh, everything you're gonna pull taut and symmetric over the sides uh, with a little bit of slack in the back. The first two clips you're gonna use are gonna be on the back side. So you're gonna to come to the back here. Again, you're gonna put it taut. And you're gonna clip into these things in. They just snap on to the end pieces and that's gonna put tension in the back. When you get a really morbidly obese patient, you might have to take the C-clamp off, add some slack by a couple of inches and do the same thing on the other side. Um, and that will fit a more obese patient and have more wiggle room. Um, Ideally, you would have it as tense as you can to reduce air movement or air flow. Um, and if it was a little too tight, the object would just ride over the belly. It would make bigger windows for people to pass you stuff. But at the bare minimum, you need enough slack that somebody could pass you an item in a controlled fashion uh, on the sides. The other two locations people could access the patient are from the side triangles. Right there. Each of the C-clamps snaps on. And Pete, keeping tension on the back. Yeah. Now I'm going to make it tight over the top, and C-clamp one, C-clamp two, so we just have the back and the top, and the last piece in this axis is going to be the front, come around. So the front user actually needs some slack, so what I'm going to do is put the end piece with as much slack as I can perform in the front. And then again, I'm gonna clip to the side. I'm not gonna do it tight. I'm gonna give it a couple of inches of slack. Right. 
And you can also tuck things underneath or roll the seat clamps to actually tuck things on the underside of the components. That'll help minimize any flow of air underneath the device. Um, so you're gonna get this front working space that is now defined by the arms. The sides can be completely draped if you want them to. In theory, with gravity, they'll just fall down. Um, if you do want to secure them, again, you can just keep using more C-clamps. What I'd recommend doing uh, is taking one for just the side itself and doing just the side. Um, and then whatever slack you want to get rid of, fold over a few times into the working space. And again, apply a clamp. Um, you would just repeat that for the other side. So here's my working space I can reach inside. I can choose to clamp the sides in advance if I want, but I don't have to. Um, the only thing I have to do uh, is provide enough clamping so that I create a workspace and the curtain stays in place. Now, if you've applied all the C-clamps, you can move this object around a fair amount uh, without the tent actually moving or adjusting. And ideally, you would have this tent assembled and ready to go um, before the patient gets on the bed. So when the patient arrives on the bed, you simply take this tent and place it on the patient and you can make small modifications for the abdomen on the bottom ones, for the end user if you want over here. In an emergency, you could cut an X and that would give an extra working space for a person to use. Again, they could also access it from the back end and hand to equipment in a controlled fashion. And you could put a negative vacuum source uh, on the side or abdomen of the patient to draw particles away from the end user. Um, I'll show in a super video how to make that with uh, three parallel uh, vacuum tubes. So here's a demonstration of how it would work. You would have your patient already on the bed in the room, and in a perfect situation, you would have already assembled your tent before you decide to intubate. So let's assume we're in that perfect world. You had a very nice resident who actually took the time to set these things up in advance. And the tent is set up and just sitting on the other stretcher in the recess bay um, or set on the side um, but fully assembled someone spent the five minutes so patient rolls in you make the decision to intubate you get the equipment you would want and you set it down next to the patient push your meds do whatever you're going to do before you start generating an aerosolized event then you're going to grab your tent which weighs five pounds, is already fully assembled, and you're gonna place it over the patient on the stretcher. Now, what it's gonna do is it's gonna cover all the danger zone. Um, and if you need to make adjustments, um, someone else can be making the adjustments while you're actually setting up for intubation. So for example, if they had a really big abdomen and you need to make more slack in the bottom, you could loosen up one of these clips and add less tension and clip it back down. Uh, we'd have to work out some standard way of setting it up. Um, and there's clips all throughout the setup that you can change the tension if you need, but the person intubating is not doing these extra tasks, everyone else is. There are two points of access to the patient with this setup. Ideally, you're not putting in through, uh, items through the side, but rather with the person's admin here, it's naturally gonna make a window. People can provide items underneath to the patient. And again, in a perfect world, we have a vacuum source of some kind drawing things away from the highest risk user, which is the intubator. So, of the hood is actually over the patient. Um, there's one predefined user space you have to have, which is the person doing the intubation. If you want to, in advance, you can cut holes uh, on the other two ports if you want to three people working in the same space, uh, and you would make the windows uh, partially closed so that unless someone breaks the seal, it stays closed. So for the intubation, obviously, you have to put your arms to the space. So there are two six-inch holes. You put your hands to the holes. There's no sharp objects. You have a uh, working room, you can go left, you can right, you can go up, you can down. The amount of slack you set in the front defines how much working space you have. Um, but I can get right up on the object and pull all the way back very easily without cutting my arms like the other two acrylic designs that are out there from Taiwan. So in this space, I can see through the vinyl, I can see the patient, I can manipulate and move. If I need to, I can ask people to adjust the uh, container. Otherwise, I have to come back out and move the container. It weighs five pounds, so it's very easy to do. So I'm in my working space, I can grab my tools, so that you can move over my shoulder. So I can confirm my equipment works. I have everything set up in the space I would need. If not, I'd ask an assistant to pass it in from the other side. Um, so I perform my intubation. And if you notice, uh, in the other two uh, models out there, uh, you can't actually uh, bring an object up with height. So if you notice with the video scope, I have an extra foot above this uh, patient that I actually need to be working space. 
and if the acrylic only goes a few inches above the face, I can't do this, bring an object in and manipulate over the space, um, because at the very least I have to go at least a foot over the patient for most video scopes. So I'm in my space, I can do my manipulation with a fair amount of movement without an issue. I can grab my ET tube, and again, if you watch, as the ET tube comes over and gets placed, uh, unless I'm placing very, very low angle, again, I need some working space. So anything that's rigid and I'm hitting against, I'm not gonna be able to have enough working space to manipulate the tube. So I can place the ET tube, withdraw my tools, secure the tube, and at this point, now that the ET tube is in place, I can either take my arm out and uh, take the ventilator piece in and make the connection, uh, and then the respiratory therapist can set up from the outside. Alternatively, if I really need a second set of hands, um, there can be a working window through the side. Again, two uh, holes between four to six inches. Um, and again, they should stay sealed unless somebody breaks the seal. So these vinyl sheets, you'd have to make these little pre-cuts, they take a few seconds each. Um, but then the ventilator component can come in, connect, uh, and then once everything is connected, then do I remove my hands and then do I leave these open spaces. Um, uh, you could also make covers or caps or a second flap you put over if you wanted to seal it. Once everything is done and you have a connection uh, and you actually want to take this whole container off, what I would recommend doing is actually uh, moving the container towards the feet. So if the ventilator component is coming in through here, um, I would just simply uh, make a cut, take these clips off, down the container um, or just start disassembling it. Uh, but once there's enough space between the vent and the connection here, uh, I can lift the object up uh, and place it over the patient and put it on their feet. Uh, and that way this can get uh, cleaned up and sorted out. And we haven't uh, put the contaminated container on the floor or near anybody else. Once all the airway situation is secured and done, um, then a secondary user can come from the other side and disassemble. Alright, for the second phase, the container has been moved to the foot of the bed. It's a little bit easier than, say, putting it to the side or the back. There's usually not much space on this end. But to the feet, you have time to get it out uh, at your own leisure. Um, uh, some basic things you can do, you can spray it down with bleach before you make your movement. Um, but at the bare minimum, you can safely remove all the retaining clamps. Um, there are four on each side. Take all your clamps off. And then what you can do is you can take it off in a controlled manner where you basically pinch in the middle and slide off. That way the contaminated ends come together. So I'm going to lift the sheet and pull it off. And the last person has to worry about contaminating is the patient because they're already infected. And then again, you can take the sheet, fold it a few times, and place it in the trash. Uh, if they're only a few bucks a piece, so it's probably not worth recycling, but that can be uh, disposed of. And then for this part, what you can do is uh, on the bed itself, you can start to disassemble it, uh, much like in the assembly video, each piece disconnects. And you would do all this with your PPE still on. And these all containers can be dropped into a bucket, uh, soaked with bleach, um, or again, they're a couple bucks each, they can be thrown away. Um, that's it.